welcome to the Free Cities podcast. My name is Timothy Allen, and this is the official podcast of the Free Cities Foundation. Hello, and welcome to episode number 12 of the Free Cities podcast. Now, this is the second iteration of my series of conversations recorded in Prague. And today I'm talking to a gentleman by the name of Josef Tetek. Josef is an author, educator and founder of the Slovak Ludwig von Mises Institute. He also hosts the popular Czech podcast Stakui, which is a show about Bitcoin, money and freedom. Now, Josef's background in Austrian economics and political philosophy informs the majority of our conversation. And we start off by having an interesting discussion about the private provision of public goods and the various incarnations of this model that have existed around the world. Josef makes particular reference to BB Centrum, which is a privately owned public neighborhood not far from where we were recording the podcast in Prague. Other topics discussed include social engineering, the evolution and dissolution of the state, digital gulags, and Josef reports on what he discovered about monetary colonialism during a recent trip to the African Bitcoin Conference in Ghana. This was another extremely fascinating conversation from the Czech Republic. Look out for more of them on this show over the next few weeks. And if you're enjoying our content, please leave us a review on your podcasting app. And thank you in advance. In the meantime, just leaves for me to say, please sit back, relax and enjoy my conversation with Josef Tetek. time I come to Prague I find out about all these things that are going on because it's all in Czech Mm -hmm. no one else like none of us get to privy to any of these things and um, that's what I love about this place you know there's a massive scene here and I didn't realize as well correct me if I'm wrong but what I'm just what I'm discovering is there's quite a big freedom scene here is it is that fair to say if you look at Europe or in general or, or Eastern Europe or whatever is it is it is it quite a strong scene here yeah I don't really have a comparison across all the countries that's uh, sort of a problem with Bitcoiners and libertarians in Europe we are very fragmented and usually we don't know what's going on in Italy or France or Spain because we don't speak the language uh, but as for Czech Republic, uh, like the Austrian school and libertarianism, this is very strong and has been very strong here since the 90s uh, for multiple reasons, like all the books from Friedman, Mises, Hayek were translated very early on and distributed through proper channels. Uh, a lot of the discussions uh, in the mainstream media uh, was like revolving around uh, libertarianism. And our uh, one of the, the second president, in fact, of uh, the Czech Republic uh, when Czechoslovakia split. So the second president after Václav Havel, that was uh, Václav Klaus, and he was quite libertarian or let's say classical liberal. He, he always loved uh, Friedman. So uh, we have quite a strong foundation of like libertarianism and anarcho-capitalism as well. And um, yeah. Is that, is that um, a, a symptom of the history of the Czech Republic or according to you? Partially, yeah, partially, definitely. Uh, people had uh, strong animosity against socialism in the 90s. So 90s was a sort of uh, the free era. And uh, these thoughts were very interesting to people, like uh, Austrian school and um, Chicago School of Economics and the whole like sound economics uh, discipline and, of course, uh, the political philosophy that comes along with it, libertarianism. And um, but um, I don't think, for example, in Slovakia, it's as strong as in Czech Republic. Maybe we had a better luck on... Uh, uh, the individuals, uh, for example, my, uh, like, uh, how do you say it, uh, 
my my uh, tutor of my master's thesis, uh, he was very active in uh, like political political philosophy activism. Uh, we had a, like a libertarian institute uh, founded in 1989. And he was very active in that, and he translated all the books from Rothbard and uh, Mises and Hayek, and uh, he had a good, uh, good standing with uh, the University of Economics, where he headed one department, and he was very influential. So we had we had a good luck on people like that that uh, were able to get into influential positions and spread like uh, libertarianism and Austrian School of Economics for uh, the past uh, 30 years. It's not as strong now as it used to be. Uh, but still, uh, maybe it's not as strong now in universities, uh, but it is in uh, like uh, in blogs, uh, think tanks, YouTube, and stuff like that. Yeah. Would you say that when when the sort of socialist system broke down, the void people were looking to replace that void with something, and at that point, I mean, how old are you? I take it you weren't around. I'm 38. So what did you experience was, of that era? Yeah, I was four years old uh, when the Iron Curtain fell. So I don't remember that. <laughs> I uh, okay, only, I'm, I'm, what yeah. I'm interested to work out is, because Austrian economics was something that I didn't hear about until I was well into my 40s, right? uh-huh. yeah, which is unusual when you think about it, because economics is, is an important subject. I studied economics at hmm. what we call A-level, which isn't a high level, but I did study it. Um, and no one mentioned anything about Austrian economics. So what I'm wondering is, when a, in, the, in, the, in the case of the Czech Republic, when everything broke down and, and people were obviously asking questions like, what is a good system? Or what is, um, and why was it that Austrian economics was offered up and, and not Keynesianism or, or you know, the, 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 the route that I came? How come Austrian economics slipped in there? And, and did, it, did it out-compete um the you know the other theories let's say yeah um i don't know if i have like uh, the real answers here but uh the liberal institute liberal institute that was founded in 1999 and uh like the economists uh during the 80s were already sort of aware of hayek and uh mises and all the greats and uh, they were eager to published these books that they basically uh, translated into their uh, like night table and weren't able to publish it before. So very early on in the early 90s, uh, these books were published. And um, since these were like academicians, uh, academics, uh, they had a good standing with the universities. They were free to uh, express their thoughts and... I don't know, we are just lucky to have a couple of uh, high quality individuals that uh, knew like how to steer the country in the right way. Of course, a lot of uh, uh, stuff that's criticized now happened in the 90s, like when uh, all, not all, but a lot of stuff was privatized. A lot of people hate that uh, until today. But uh, yeah, like... Um, the, the books of uh, all the greats in Austrian economics and libertarianism were published early on. And then these people and their students started to publish uh, works of their own. And it sort of sort of uh, lived on from then. As I say, now it's uh, no longer as strong. Uh, the University of Economics that was uh, for some time quite... Uh, uh, full of uh, Austrian economists uh, got sort of perched <laughs> for some internal reasons. And, um, but yeah, uh, the, the legacy is here. The, the tradition of Austrian school is here, definitely. And you say it's taught in universities? It was when uh, I studied, around 2010. Uh, I had a good luck on uh, studying the Faculty of Economic Policy at the uh, University of Economics. And uh, we uh, had a compulsory reading of uh, Mary Rothbard and uh, Mises and Bastiat and uh, very great discussions about uh, Mark Thornton's uh, take on prohibition. And we read uh, articles from uh, the American Mises Institute all the time and discussed them. And yeah, so my university studies were uh, a perfect uh, 
real like Austrian school uh, education, which uh, isn't the case <laughs> for most people. So I, uh, I'm. Uh, it's kind of funny for me when you say you discovered it in your 40s, because for me it was just part of uh, my uh, university studies. But I aimed uh, to uh, go to that faculty because I knew this was going on in there. And it was sort of special in Czech Republic as well. Uh, so I uh, wanted to have this type of education. And then I uh, wrote uh, my master's thesis on pub on private provision of public goods, because that was uh, what uh, was really exciting about for me, that everybody was saying, like, uh, you cannot have... Uh, uh, you cannot have like private uh, sidewalks, private parks, uh, and there's so much literature about this uh, happening throughout history, mostly in the United States, but also in Europe, like the private toll roads. And of course, uh, Ronald Cozy's example with lighthouses, where he disputed Samuelson, that was always beautiful to me. Sorry, with what? Which one? Uh, with lighthouses, like uh, the private lighthouses in uh, England, in medieval England, I think it was. Because Paul Samuelson always gave, uh, like a typical example of public good uh, is a lighthouse, according to Paul Samuelson. And Ronald Coase um, sort of doubted that. And he actually went and looked through the evidence and found out that uh, in England, and I'm not sure about the period, uh, probably wasn't the medieval times, was later on. Uh, but they found out that uh, lighthouses were actually provided uh, privately. And uh, what, the shipping companies paid a... Small... Yeah, you, you, you paid uh, the, the fee uh, in the port. Like it was, uh, it was uh, um, part of uh, like uh, the package of services and you paid for the lighthouses uh, as well. And that's actually a brilliant example of uh, how... Um, like the so-called public goods can be bundled with uh, services you are already consuming or you want to consume, and you can have these public goods uh, privately provisioned. A good example is a park or sidewalks or public lightning or street lightning, uh, because, uh, for example, in Prague, there is uh, this, uh, let's say, a private zone uh, at Brumovka, BB Centrum, and you you couldn't tell like uh, when you, when you are uh, in that place you cannot tell it's a it's all privately owned because it's free to enter nobody takes uh, any fees uh, but the way it's uh, structured is uh, there are residential housings uh, there are uh, office complexes and the rent is sufficiently high and the the surrounding environment is uh, is of a high quality so the uh, renters are willing to pay the higher rent so you just bundle the so-called public uh, goods with the private one, private ones with the need to pay for um for the housing or the office space and yeah that's how you do it uh, the, the same is in new york uh, there there's also Bryant Park, I'm not sure how it's structured actually, but uh, Bryant Park is also privately provisioned. There's, that's quite a famous example. That's interesting because um, intuitively you would put a fence around that place. Yeah. So, so why is why is that? Why is there no fence around it? Like, I, I get the idea that um, it's it's affordable. Um, but why wouldn't you put a fence around it? I mean, you would have imagined the people that are paying would intuitively think, okay, well, let's make sure that no one, you know, devalues our our investment here. Yeah, that uh, that can also be the case, and it is uh, in case of gated communities. Uh, these are uh, normal around the world, and even in Prague, we have uh, we, we have uh, quite a large one. And within this gated community in Prague, there is a huge park that's beautiful. And uh, I went there for my master's thesis. And um, but if you have like a like a neighborhood with uh, shops and uh, office buildings, you don't want to restrict the access. It doesn't make sense. And what makes sense then is to have this public area that is privately controlled and uh, increases the rent, increases the um, the land value, and you just uh, gather uh, like the the payments for that uh, in this bundled way, where the rent is higher simply. And, do you happen and to know? Works. Do you happen to know if that's a common experience around the world? Um, Privately owned public places. 
Yeah, I, I would like to take a look into that uh, after more than 10 years since I wrote uh, oh, this okay. paper. <laughs> uh, because I, uh, I researched, researched that for, for a year back then, but that was in 2011. And yeah, I discovered uh, communities like that in Europe, in the United States, um, of course in South Africa, that's quite famous for, the, that's mostly these gated communities, and throughout history. Uh, one well-known example is uh, St. Louis neighborhoods, uh, where uh, the whole neighborhoods in St. Louis were uh, privately owned and everything was privately provisioned. Um, there's also uh, a city in the United States, I probably forgot the name, that was built by Walt Disney uh, Company. Mm. And uh, it's not like a Disneyland. It's a, it's a normal, like a small town American city. I know. You I, know that one? It, white, white, uh, build, white wooden buildings. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, it's very strict about like what you strict. can do in there. <laughs> yes. yeah. So uh, what I discovered when I uh, researched that was there was a whole range of arrangements. Uh, some of it is really strict, really gated communities. Some of them are more like uh, communes. Uh, but uh, all of these uh, communities, uh, like, in some way, try to uh, provision public goods uh, without the state, without any intervention. And if there is, like, if, let's say in this uh, in this city uh, built by Walt Disney, everything is strict, but you sign the contract and you know upfront what are your rights and uh, uh, what you have to do. Like, uh, you cannot build uh, anything else than a white picket fence. For example, I remember that. I do, and, too, yes. <laughs> and in some other places, uh, I forget all the names, so sorry for that, but uh, there is one other place in the U.S. which is more like a hippie community, but has been around for quite a long time. And uh, it's not as strict, but uh, it simply works. But that's, that's a small community. So, of course, that will work maybe uh, with uh, larger larger cities. But um, there are a lot of examples from the 19th century America where uh, a lot of neighborhoods were basically privately owned and privately managed and it worked and it was uh, it worked uh, very well. Or uh, there were like company cities which worked as well. So throughout the story and uh, even now we have a lot of examples and as I say, it's, it's a spectrum. Uh, like there is no... Uh, like one m meme that would be true about uh, pi uh, private provision of public good. There are usually no uh, fees for entry to a private park. Usually it's, uh, that would be like the dumbest way how to organize that. Usually it's in some way bundled and uh, yeah, so you, it's a very interesting. Do you have a, um, a preferred favorite method? I, you said it's a spectrum. I agree. And and what's lovely about a spectrum is you get to choose the one you want. What what's, what's your preferred way? Yeah. So um, probably uh, the BB Centrum in Prague, where uh, you cannot really tell you are in a like a, a libertarian uh, neighborhood. <laughs> or it, it's not, of course, libertarian, but uh, the guy who owns it, um, uh, it's a privately owned company. Like uh, only I believe one person or maybe two person own that company and uh, they are like billionaires and he's uh, very religious which is quite uncommon for Czechs and uh, he has this belief that he needs to like create good communities like good neighborhoods uh, but he does it in an entrepreneurial way so he first built uh, like the office complexes which were of very high quality attracted good uh, tenants uh, that were willing to pay high rents then he built uh, uh, the park, then the, the residential housing, he built a church, uh, all the sidewalks, all the streetlights are uh, owned by the company. He basically owned, uh, owns all the land in there. And uh, yeah, it's very clean, very nice. Uh, it doesn't uh, get closed uh, for night or anything like the park and, uh, and the sidewalks. So that's my preferred version probably that's fascinating because you're you're basically describing the, the free city model in a <laughs> yeah. way you know and even prospera which is in honduras which is a, a you know probably one of the most advanced versions that are in existence 
have started in exactly the way you described the beta building was with one of the, the first building which was businesses mm-hmm. as soon as they came then they needed um accommodation which is now being built and um that's so a question about that place you were describing was it barren land did he really build it from the bottom up or is it is I, it um, yeah i'm not really certain i uh, i maybe some of it was uh like uh brown fields and some of it were maybe like uh old factories there were in the early 90s there were a lot of like uh abandoned factories and abandoned houses and brownfields around prague and uh it changed quite a lot over the past 30 years so i would it's uh, it's uh it's not in the city center, but it's not on the outskirts as well. So I don't think it was uh, totally empty before, but I believe it was just a lot of um, underutilized land and he basically bought it up uh, gradually and uh, turned it into this neighborhood. In your um, in, in your sort of framework of belief, could a system evolve that was um, a myriad of small decentralized neighborhoods like that is that something that you ever thought about or whether you think is a good good or a bad model or yeah well uh i believe it's a natural tendency if uh the state uh, like either local or uh, national were to in some way step away this is mostly what would happen uh that uh, the land in the cities is uh, very valuable usually if the city isn't like uh Mm, too bad which park definitely isn't so it would be bought up and it would be uh used for the most valuable use which uh nowadays in like western cities is office complexes parking parks residential building and like contrary to what people may think the parks and the sidewalks and the public spaces the squares will be there because this is what increases the value of uh, the the rent and of the land so um, for economists this is quite obvious but for a lot of people that uh, misunderstand uh, libertarianism uh, they believe like it's uh, some kind of dystopia where there will be only just some skyscrapers and parking fields and malls but that's not the case and yeah actually one of the authors that covers uh, this topic of private provision of public goods uh, gives an example of for example a mall that um, in the mall you actually have a lot of uh, non-commercial spaces like you have benches you have fountains you have like these uh, public spaces and it's uh, he, I, I i forgot the name of the author but he says it's uh, like a mini universe of the city and you can actually uh, see how the city in the large scale would uh, sort of be organized if it was privately owned and you can see that it's not some hellish dystopia full of concrete but it can actually be a nice place and uh, like the high quality malls usually are quite a nice places i'm not so sure i um i have that much faith in scaling though a model like that i agree that the fountains in a mall are looked after nicely but a lot of things don't scale very well <laughs> mm-hmm. and um yeah i'm not convinced that it would scale to the to the city level potentially i think you know uh, most things have a sweet spot where they work really well and it, the same goes for for most ideologies most ideas most you know right right uh it will depend on um on uh, like the certainty of uh, property rights uh, because the more certain you are of uh, your property rights and that uh, any um, investments you put into the land and what you build on it uh, that you can really accrue all the value from that the more um, long-term planning you will probably be uh, it all basically comes down to property rights like everything in economics does uh, they uh, does yeah and uh yeah you are rightly skeptical because uh, in the current current environment it maybe wouldn't work that well because the property rights aren't that certain like uh um, i don't know where they are actually certain like definitely not in czech republic and we are not the worst state uh, as such uh, there are much worse places around the world but uh this is one of the argument that um uh, Hernando de Soto makes about uh, why the developing uh, countries 
uh, are in such a bad shape and usually it's because you don't have uh, this uh, certainty in terms of property rights and you cannot use the capital that you own which for poor people is usually just the land uh, if they are farmers and you cannot uh, like uh, take a mortgage on it you cannot use it as a collateral because uh, the property rights aren't actually recorded anywhere and uh, then you cannot build any sort of capitalism around that did you <clears throat> in your work or research or anything did you go much into the best um, system for preserving property rights have you is that something that you you've thought about much well um yeah that's um uh, I didn't. I didn't uh, in this particular paper. Uh, and uh, But uh, Bruno Leoni, uh, the Italian uh, law theorist who influenced uh, Friedrich Hayek quite a lot, uh, he went into the English common law and the German, uh, I forget uh, the term for that, but uh, sort of like a common law which uh, worked in German uh, lands for hundreds of years and basically uh, the best uh, way how to uh, ensure the rule of law is uh, decentralized courts that are very independent from the state from uh, from the ru ruler uh, no legislation uh, the, the laws are usually the result of uh, like the emergent process this is where Hayek was very influenced by that uh, line of thought and uh, it's uh, it's an emergent uh, uh, system sort of like money sort of like language and the idea that we can just uh, plan this top down with some a uh, couple of hundred guys in uh, fancy buildings calling themselves uh, legislators and just like centrally plan how this will all be organized is uh, very uh, very naive and it obviously doesn't work so we cannot have uh, a strong rule of law and uh, strong property rights uh, in the current system. This is uh, like stacked against that. And it's a tough question to, uh, to, to say how we could actually get back to like the common law system or uh, what we had, uh, had here before like uh, 18th, 19th century when uh, uh, the legislative uh, process really took off. But like, uh, Legal theory is uh, not my strong, <laughs> it's my strong discipline. Really. I, I just know Bruno Leone and Friedrich Hayek, uh, and I, I love their line of thought. You, um, talking of the state, you wrote, you've written a couple of books, right? Is that right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I love, the title of one of your books is, is a brilliant title. <laughs> um, Enemies of the State, Friends of Liberty, right? Right. That's a really, I love that statement. Um, so I get that you're, you're not necessarily a, a fan of the state. No. <laughs> <laughs> so so t tell me where you see the role of the state then. Is it in a, is it, is it in a way that I will, will have heard before? Or do you, do you have any sort of like unusual ideas about it? I don't think it's unusual. Um, I was very influenced by Murray Rothbard. So uh, I am a um, flavor of anarchism. And uh, but I used to be uh, very passionate about it and trying to try to like convince everybody uh, the state sucks and uh, we need like uh, to convince everyone about libertarianism. And I, I discovered this doesn't work, actually. As a few uh, other people have, I'm sure. So, yeah, I um, I'm more practical about it. Like uh, I am very well aware that the state isn't going anywhere uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, it will be a gradual process where the state will become more and more irrelevant. irrelevant. This is how I would like to uh, for things to evolve. In terms of uh, what is uh, the proper role of state, uh, I don't think ultimately there is any. But uh, in the short term, like uh, it's hard to say. Like if I, because if I say. Uh, like police and judicial system, uh, there are so many examples of this uh, being so wrong today. Even like in Czech Republic, which is very uh, liberal towards uh, soft drug use, you still see people being uh, thrown in prison for uh, growing their weed and uh, doing the ayahuasca, uh, ayahuasca uh, rituals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, 
usually you have this idea that uh, the police just catches the bad guys, but uh, there is so much collateral damage from that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we pressed uh, like the Rothbard's red button and the state is uh, gone right now, <laughs> it would be such a chaotic era. And we sort of saw where that can lead in 90s Russia, where uh, uh, the mafia or uh, the gangs took over. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a tough one. So uh, the, the problem is uh, we, we used to have like everything in place until like 18th, 19th century uh, with the decentralized course, uh, courts, with sound money, with uh, uh, decentralized education. Uh, there was no state education back then. And the society evolved very quickly. Uh, the, it was um, like uh, <clears throat> the arts, uh, the industry, everything do, uh, evolved very quickly. quickly. And uh, we sort of uh, lost that uh, line. And now we may be at the end of like this experiment and it's going to get very chaotic and but after that i believe it's things are going so, to get so better. can you categorize that a bit what this experiment is um i think i know what you mean but i'd like to hear your words you know what is the experiment that's coming to an end right so in two words it's just social engineering it's this idea uh this um naive rationalism that you can just manage the society in all its aspects, whether it's uh, money and financial system, whether it's uh, uh, the state provision of public goods, uh, justice, policing, uh, education, uh, diet, uh, and it permeates everything. And uh, gradually in uh, individual fields we are disc rediscovering that this might not be the best uh, approach. Uh, I know that for example in the United States uh, homeschooling is uh, getting quite popular it's getting quite popular in Czech Republic as well uh, alternative approaches to diet I'm a big uh, proponent of the carnivore diet or the animal based diet uh, f uh, Yeah, and, and money like uh, this is my main topic <laughs> Like Bitcoin fixes this. Sure. Uh, before we get on to that, um, do, do, would society always tend towards that? that you know, like if this, if this gets fixed, is, is, it, is it inherent that we tend back towards this kind of centralization of, of the decision-making process? Yeah, um, that's a very good uh, question and good thing we need to be aware of that people are uh, always lured in uh, to power. And yeah, like all the philosophers uh, throughout all the history are aware of that. So yeah, uh, the lure of, lure of power will be always here. Uh, and I don't believe people will just accept libertarian thought and just get on with each other. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's a tough question that... Uh, all the political philosophers were uh, discussing about for hundreds of years or thousands. Do you have of years. a Do you have a theory? But uh, like you you said early that earlier that the the state will just dissolve into irrelevance. I think yeah, you said. Yeah. So describe how that happens then, because I don't think the state thinks that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, right. I believe um, Franz Oppenheimer, uh, the German social sociologist, he has a very good uh, theory of how the state emerged and how then it evolved in the way it did. And it had its own logic that was very hard to overcome um, like back then, like uh, tens of thousands of years before, because he describes, I don't know if you are uh, familiar with his works, but maybe I can describe it anyway. Describe it. Please. So uh, Franz Oppenheimer basically says that you had uh, like tens of thousands uh, of years before you had uh, like the farmers that uh, needed to stay in one place and cultivate the land uh, and they needed to be kept safe. And then you had uh, like the nomadic hunters that were um, basically attacking the farmers all the time. So the farmers uh, or yeah, and the nomadic uh, hunters that were uh, exploiting them, 
discovered uh, after some time that it's best not to kill the goose and to basically turn them into slaves and to protect them against other nomadic tribes. And this is uh, how, according to Oppenheimer, the, uh, the state emerged. And it has its own logic. It was basically, uh, it was an exploitative uh, uh, relationship, but it uh, made sense at the time and it was basically uh, mutually beneficial. And then it evolved from that where uh, the state was always like this uh, partially protective, partially exploitative force uh, that was uh, attached to like the productive sector. And I believe the technology uh, changes this equation where uh, uh, gradually the productive uh, elements of the society do not need this uh, protection from the force by uh, the slave masters, by the exploiters, by uh, the politi political class. Uh, I believe uh, money is a big part of that because uh, the state always needed a monopoly of money because this is how you exploit the society uh, in the most elegant way without bashing anybody, ro anybody over the head. And uh, yeah, if we uh, separate the money from the state, it's getting it's going to get uh, much harder for the state to keep as much power as it has now. I I can I could agree with that. <clears throat> I like it. I like that analogy. The um, the the it it does seem to be that way. Um, so what what I would take away from that is that currently the state is in the process of trying to. You said that forces at the moment are destabilizing the state. The state, would you say? Yeah. I, and what I, it, what is that technology? In yeah, your it's mostly technology. Uh, and in my book uh, about Bitcoin, I have an example of uh, the media, where uh, first, like, let's say, two hundred years ago, it was much easier for the state to control the media if it wanted to, because uh, it was just uh, at first it was just. Uh, some messengers reading uh, the decrees uh, in the public square. Then it uh, was uh, newspapers and printed books. And this is very easy to control if you if you want to. Uh, then uh, there emerged uh, radios and televisions, still very much centralized, very easy to control. And uh, the socialist uh, states all knew that, the Nazis knew that, and used these new forms of communication for propaganda. And uh, during uh, our communist times, uh, all the television, all the radio, all the newspapers, all the book printing was in some way managed by the state and uh, uh, always connected to some state propaganda. But uh, with the internet, this uh, was sort of turned on, on its head. I know there are a lot of like examples of censorship and the state is still sort of trying to keep control. But if uh, you have the ability to uh, tweet, uh, to run your own YouTube channel, and it doesn't have to be YouTube anymore right now, uh, there are uh, nowadays there are uh, other alternatives emerging. And... Uh, like I don't think anybody can dispute that uh, the internet uh, opened up uh, the discussion to like really decentralize the discussion and a lot of uh, lot of uh, voices that uh, wouldn't have any uh, way to express themselves now have have it. Uh, like a really fringe example is Alex Jones. Like uh, whatever you think of him, he would never be invited to any uh, like public television in the 70s, let's say, but with the internet, he had his own channel and he was, he's very influential. And, uh, right, so the media is probably the best example in that. Uh, but education as well, like you can access uh, all the courses of American universities now. We have Coursera, Udemy, you have all these platforms. You can learn from YouTubers. Uh, you can uh, buy books on Amazon for uh, like the Kindle books or you can download these. So uh, the access to education it's also uh, quite decentralized and people are just breaking up to the fact that uh, the public schooling doesn't really provide you with education anymore, or I don't know if it ever did. So uh, the media, the education, great examples. And uh, yeah, I believe technology is basically a very liberating uh, instrument. Okay, so I'm going to have to push back on that because yeah. <clears throat> two reasons. One is... I agree with you that the internet opened up many things. But currently, you could argue most people experience the internet through for, for oligarchical 
companies, which are no better or worse than the state. In fact, they may even be the new, the new state <laughs> that's mm-hmm. emerged. So that's my first, right. uh, yeah. my first question. My second one will be that I think obviously there's a very compelling argument that um, technology is actually um, empowering the state, and a good example of that would be um, CBDCs, central bank digital currencies and the technology of, say, a social credit score system, Mm -hmm. which will be scaling authoritarianism. Prior to that, I mean, if you look at somewhere like Russia, you know, you try to scale authoritarianism, and in the end it collapsed under its own weight. Right. Okay, but now, you know, technology allows authoritarianism to scale. For example, with the social credit score system, it's a self perpetuating system that it doesn't need a bureaucracy to run it it's run by algorithms and it's just as it's just as powerful as you know an oligarch sitting in a castle controlling the, his surrounding area so right, right. so there are my two things so so what's your answer to that one that technology does actually empower the state mm-hmm. and two um that the internet is already an example of how it's been co-opted by large powerful organizations yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll address uh, the second one first. Uh, so the internet in its current form is here f- maybe for like 20 years. And already throughout these 20 years, we have seen uh, the platforms emerge and fall. Uh, there, are, like, there are many examples like MySpace is uh, the usual one or ICQ. So uh, depends on how these companies uh, will be able to build a moat around them, like the uh, regulatory uh, moat. Uh, that would be uh, the real danger. Because uh, as it is now, still to some way, in some way, uh, the newcomers still can uh, disrupt the sector. Uh, and uh, uh, already we see that, like Facebook, it's a real huge money-making machine, but uh, the young people aren't uh, setting up, setting up uh, accounts on Facebook. They are either on Twitter or TikTok, which TikTok is horrible, of course. But uh, the, the, uh, the thing is, it's, uh, it's not a monopoly. There are like so many alternatives emerging all the time. And uh, I don't believe Facebook will be as powerful 10 or 20 years from now because people will basically not care anymore about it um yeah so it's a very short uh, period so far for the internet and i believe uh, throughout this period of like 20 25 years it has proven that it is uh, like nobody has uh, as a, a real like monopoly on it uh, and uh, we can see it even with uh, twitter it's losing money <laughs> in a horrible at a horrible pace and a lot of uh, a lot of the scale that was built over the past 10 years is also uh, due to uh, easy money policies because these corporations were able to finance themselves through uh, very low interest rates and uh, they took the advantage of that. So we will see how it goes in the 20s, which doesn't seem to be uh, the uh, low interest rate uh, era uh, i think this decade will be quite different so and the second one was uh if the state can uh, misuse these tools for their own uh, gain and of course the state always tries to use technology like that but um, i believe digital technologies are much more accessible to normal to like uh, ordinary people which uh, wasn't the case with uh like machinery or television channels, like uh, military machinery, I mean. Uh, and uh, with digital technology, it's very hard to keep it uh, keep it uh, in check. Uh, even in China, where the Bitcoin mining was banned, there are still a lot of Bitcoin miners. Bitcoin is still used. And uh, one thing is like Chinese propaganda and what you like hear about. And of course, it seems like the state has everything under control. The other thing is it's simply over 1 billion people and uh, people will always find a way how to communicate, exchange value, exchange goods and services. And I believe ultimately digital technologies are liberating technologies. But of course, uh, we need to be vigilant and we need to use like the proper tools. I would rather use a signal and an encrypted uh, peer-to-peer messenger over... Uh, like the Facebook Messenger, because uh, this is not uh, safe, right? So there is uh, definitely some level of education uh, for people 
to 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 attain. Uh, yeah, but it's uh, it's much more accessible. That's that's how I would sum, sum it up. And when some technology is accessible and provides like some real benefits to people, people will adopt it uh, sooner or later. Will they though? <laughs> like yeah. without pushing back again, like. Are you sure that history has taught us that people will push back? That's the thing. I mean, um, <clears throat> I, I, my, my own particular view of this is that um, all the authoritarianisms up until this point have been part of the game, and now it's the final boss. Because the final boss is, is the authoritarianism that can scale indefinitely. Which, which I think it was always limited by physical f mm. factors before, or you couldn't get the bureaucracy big enough. You couldn't get enough people to join mm -hmm. the state to, to, to enforce it. But with algorithms, you can. And it actually takes, you could, you could be one guy sitting up in an ivory tower and you could control a billion people with algorithms because they're already invested in it. And it's obviously a very... It's a very compelling network of um, digital, you know, a digital sort of structure that, that, that keeps you in place. Mm. And it's very obvious to me that it's happening because we're already kind of doing it. We're already voluntarily joining it. Um, and like I say, going back to my two points, currently most people are interacting into the digital world through one of four platforms mm -hmm. pretty much. And and if you think that they have your best interest at heart, I don't know who does, but uh, you know, yeah, you yeah, can't, you agree. can't. They're, yeah. they're no better or worse than than large states, uh, you know, large countries. Um, so there's that, and the fact that the, the that they can now scale indefinitely mm -hmm. with, at the touch of a button, they don't need a bureaucracy, they don't need millions of people enforcing. They're they're, they're enforcing it through um, currently a box that you carry in your pocket with with a digital screen on it, and who knows what that will be one day. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm don't want to sound too naive about it. Like uh, there are real dangers, like we've seen in Canada with the Freedom Convoy. You, you can be easily cut off from all the financial platforms uh, if you misbehave, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so. Um, in some part, people need to uh, pay attention, which is uh, maybe too optimistic uh, for the majority of the society. But um, yeah, I don't believe you can construct like a digital gulag uh, without... Because if you do that, uh, I don't think like, for example, the Chinese system is very stable. I believe in uh, at some point... the. Like the Chinese government will basically uh, collapse under its own weight, and uh, and it boils down to economics uh, because uh, there is this impression that China is like the uh, huge economic power, but as as we've seen last year with Evergrande and uh, the whole like real estate market uh, basically collapsing and needed to be bailed out, uh, the structure of Chinese economy is very uh, is in very bad shape. And uh, they really cannot afford any large recession. And like this is basically the deal that uh, you can partially control the society through these tools, as you describe, but you need to provide something in exchange, like a gradually increasing um, life standards, which has been the case in China for the past 30 years. But if the second ver uh, part of the equation doesn't work anymore, if the... Uh, if the life standards don't increase anymore uh, because of uh, the socialistic planning basically turns, uh, hits the dead end, then I believe the surveillance won't work anymore as well that, because that, people just will hit that tipping point. And this is basically how Soviet Union collapsed as well because it basically ran out of uh, resources to exploit and the, the, the difference between... Uh, life standards in in the West and in the East was too too large, and people because of technology were able to learn about how people live in the West, and uh, it basically uh, collapsed under its own weight. Right? History would tell us though that um, that's not how 
the mob works. The mob basically offers you a deal, which is I won't hurt you <laughs> if you do what I say. It's not living standards that keep getting better. It's I won't do X, Y, Z to you. Now, in the old system, that they, they, you physically had to come around and beat someone up to get them to do what you wanted. In the new system, you switch off their privileges hmm. via an algorithm, via a, via a network. Is that a, you know is that going to collapse as well? Because that that's the that's the thing I well, I worry about uh, the most. That would be very hard to get out of if we didn't have any alternative. And the alternatives are emerging. Like uh, if you get cut off from Facebook or Twitter, you will use Signal, you will use Mastodon or Nostra. If you get cut off from uh, the financial system, you will use Bitcoin. And uh, these are all alternatives that uh, came around uh, only in the past couple of years. Like Bitcoin has been here for 14 years, Signal, I don't know how long it's been here, but it's quite recent. Everything is quite recent here. And uh, yeah, so you have the alternative if you get cut off. And uh, we have the power to tell the stories of people that uh, this happens to. And uh, I believe stories are powerful. And of course, not all the society will take care, but uh, will take notice. But... uh, like from the individual level, you will have an alternative, which is important. Because if we, for example, have a full world of CBDC and a cashless society, that's very dystopian, definitely. But uh, you have the ability to use Bitcoin to protect yourself against that. And that's very hard to stop. Mm-hmm. Well, talking of Bitcoin, <clears throat> you wrote a great article in Bitcoin magazine about um, what's going on in Africa. You just went to Africa, right? Yeah, uh, African Bitcoin conference in yes. Ghana. But um, I wonder if you could mention a little bit about, for people that don't know, um, what what I, one of the takeaways from what reading that was that um, Bitcoin is easily understood by many African nations because of the way that various organizations, the IMF, the World Bank, but also um, uh, the what's it called the CFA the CFA system yeah. the CFA Colonial system Frank, yeah. yeah if you could just talk a little bit about that what you discovered because I, I I think that's something like the CFA system I think is something that a lot of people don't even know about yeah I, I didn't know about it um, until like eighteen months ago and so yeah let's begin maybe with the CFA system and. Everything I know about Africa and uh, its circumstances basically comes from Alex Gladstein. So uh, I would uh, heavily recommend Alex Gladstein's articles on Bitcoin Magazine or his book, uh, Check Your Financial Privilege. So uh, the CFA system, that is uh, a way for uh, Western governments, mainly France, uh, mainly France uh, to keep a hold on uh, their former colonies. Uh, in the central and uh, western Africa, uh, there are, I believe, uh, 14 countries that use the CFA. It's Which is the cur- a currency. This, it's a currency. Uh, Cent- what does it stand for? Um, it's in French. But, uh, uh, yeah, okay. it's, uh, well, it's, it's a currency owned by France. Which it's, is issued yeah. to these countries. It is managed by French uh, Ministry of Finance, yes. And uh, yeah, it's provided to these countries. And uh, the, the French uh, government has devalued this, uh, this currency, I believe, 99% over the, the past 70 years since, uh, since it uh, uh, has been in use, I believe, since 50s. And... Uh, one of the devaluations was in early 90s where they basically just uh, cut it in half uh, and suddenly the money was worth 50% uh, from day to day. It was worth 50% uh, of uh, its previous rate. But so, they have complete control over the monetary policy. Yeah, they, have they con- can print it, they can, control, can yeah. destroy it, they can do whatever they want. Yeah, uh, yeah they can. And uh, part of the deal is also for... Um, the producers in the country, which are usually uh, like resource producers, like miners, um, that uh, they need to offer their goods. If they are selling abroad, they need to uh, offer them to French companies first. And uh, they have the like the right of first refusal. And after that, they can 
sell to the global market. So the French companies exploit this heavily and they buy uh, the raw resources and then they sell them like uh, the value-added machines and goods uh, back uh, for a huge profit. Uh, the IMF and World Bank also uh, exploits uh, the African countries as well. This is what Alex Gladstein talked about at the conference. Um, they, <laughs> he beautifully explained how uh, they were very willing to lend a lot of money to dictators in these countries. And uh, these dictators basically bought uh, like private uh, jets and mansions and uh, companies in Switzerland and uh, financed their uh, bank accounts in Switzerland. Then they either died or uh, fled the country, but the, the debt burden stayed uh, in the country uh, and the citizens need to pay it, uh, pay it back over the decades. So yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's well, it's simply horrible. I, I think the, it, it's monetary colonialism is another yeah, way of describing it. Yeah, that's it. a proper term. You have a bunch of money that you own, that you even control. You lend it out um, at a high interest rate. I mean, it's 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 a classic. It's like loan sharking on a, on, yeah. on a grand scale. Uh, and when they can't pay it back, then you say, right, well, cool, give us some, give us some of your assets. Yes, yeah. And uh, of, also... Um, the new uh, like uh, tiers of um, credit always come along with some uh, requirements on the country. For example, in Ghana, uh, just before the conference, they, which was in December, uh, the Ghanaian government accepted a new tier of uh, credit facility from the World Bank, I guess, or IMF. And one of, the, one of the requirements was uh, COVID passes. Like you need a uh, COVID pass, a COVID uh, like vaccination to enter the country. And that was the requirement from the IMF. So <laughs> one would crazy. assume that that is a precursor to um, another type of pass. That that does seem a bit unusual to, to, to insist on something like that. I yeah. mean, I wonder how they justified that maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like one of uh, my takeaways from the conference talking to like uh, Africans from various countries was Africa is obviously uh, like a testing uh, place for a lot of nasty stuff like uh, CBDC. Nigeria is one of the first countries where they really rolled out proper CBDC and they are starting to fight against uh, cash and uh, the capital requirements in Nigeria are crazy. You cannot buy anything uh, you, uh, with your card. You cannot buy anything abroad for more than $20. Uh, also today I've read uh, that uh, some entrepreneur in Senegal was buying uh, stuff uh, abroad and he spent like $50 and the police came into his house and like uh, questioned him and it's, uh, it's totally horrible. And the other thing is, this is maybe a kind of a niche problem, but there's this word coin, uh, like this uh, eye scanning orb. Yes. You are aware of that? World coin. Yeah. World coin. Yeah. I didn't realize it was still going. Yeah. Nobody knows it's still going because it's sort of disappeared from the discourse on Twitter and in the Western media, but it's being rolled out uh, across uh, like in Kenya and in Isn't other African countries. Isn't that the countries. one that, that <laughs> scans your iris to, yeah, to yeah. get i mean it's it's so dystopian yeah. it's horrendous yeah it, it is it is it's uh, really still going yeah it is going uh people from kenya were telling me yeah this is going this is happening in, and in they kenya. pay they scan your iris to get all your kind of data let's say yeah. <laughs> and in return you get some of their their the token token yeah, that they've printed, created out thin, yeah. out thin air so yeah obviously God, that needs to be made a Honestly, I, I really thought that died a death um, because it was so atrocious. It was such an atrocious idea that... So it's being tested in Africa and a lot of uh, stuff like that is being uh, apparently tested in Africa. So, uh, right, maybe like about my impressions from the conference itself. Well, just, or, your, yeah, I mean, I it's something we don't hear a lot about, um, you know, like, um, for example, you know, the antithesis to what, to to um, what you've just described is what's happening in El Salvador, which is snubbing the IMF and and issuing your own you know ways of of generating income for a country. So maybe maybe um, yeah, your takeaways. I mean, it, I, did you come away positive? Yeah, very 
uh, like the, the energy uh, from the, at the conference was something else, like uh, something I didn't experience at other conferences. And there are like a lot of high quality conferences, but uh, Bitcoiners in the Western world and Czech Republic is part of that, I, I would say, are uh, very like rational about Bitcoin and um, maybe they can be even emotional, but they um, do not accept Bitcoin as much f- because of their experiences. Uh, because uh, for the Western countries, uh, the fiat money system basically works. Uh, the payment systems work. You can uh, get a bank account unless you're someone like Alex Jones, of course. Uh, you can pay with cards. There are instant payments now as well. And the inflation rates weren't that high until recently. Uh, but in the Africa, if we're African countries, most of them, um, they are, there are basically no payment systems. It's uh, mostly all based on cash. Uh, you, it's very hard to do any cross-border transactions because there are strong capital controls everywhere. Uh, you are not in control of your money because of the CFA system. There are no sovereign currencies like for these 14 countries. In some other countries, they have their own money, of course. And the inflation rates are something else, like uh, 20% is quite uh, quite normal for them. And there are countries that have like 50% inflation. And Zimbabwe uh, right now is entering uh, another uh, hyperinflation. So my impression was... Uh, and. This has been talked about uh, quite a lot, that Africans do not need convincing that fiat money sucks and they are naturally always looking for some alternative. It's very hard to get dollars, for example, in Nigeria or South Africa. It's hard to get euros. Um, So you are kind of stuck with what you have. And Bitcoin is uh, a godsend in these countries. And if you... um, and th- th- this was not just an impression from conference. We actually talked to some locals at the beach, uh, with taxi drivers, with uh, people in the restaurants. And if you just show them that they can download an app, uh, receive a Bitcoin, no registrations needed, nothing required of them. And then they can buy like airtime on bit refill with it. It's mind blowing for them. It's a mind blowing experience for us. It's quite normal because you can do that uh, with Apple Pay or whatever. But in Africa, in Ghana, you had you never had any uh, possibility to do that. And uh, uh, at the conference, there are a lot of like there are a lot of uh, builders, a lot of community organizers, uh, developers working on really like advanced stuff, but all with this aspect of this needs to be useful right here, right now for people that uh, have like real world problems. It's not a, like a toy. It's uh, not like a speculative thing. It's uh, something that can really connect the African countries because no one else is going to do that for them. And they need this neutral technology that is able to bypass all the controls like the CFA system and uh, make their lives better. I actually talked to one guy from Somalia, which uh, was like uh, crazy for me to meet somebody from Somalia, Somalia, which is like this uh, totally uh, disrupted, uh, failed failed state. And he says uh, there's a village in Somalia where he's from, and uh, it's basically all just Bitcoin because uh, otherwise they wouldn't be able to buy any groceries, any uh, any uh, pharmaceuticals, and they survive just because uh, he knows about Bitcoin and he's able to travel to some city and buy some stuff with Bitcoin and just drive it back to the village. Really? Has that been rep- has that ever been reported? I've never heard that story. Uh, no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> but, you uh, met a dude in, in, and there's a village in Somalia where the people are using Bitcoin because that's all they can use. Yeah, and there were so many stories like that uh, at the conference. God, I'm going to have to dig deeper in that one. That's fascinating. Hey, I, I, I'm cognizant of time here. I, I know you've got to go, but we've got a bit longer. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you, um, you're talking about Bitcoin in the context of Africa there and a certain merging nations and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I was interested to know what your opinion on what you know of the free cities movement and what it, why it's evolving, why it's here, what it represents. Um, what's your impression of whether or not Bitcoin is necessary or not? Right. So uh, to be honest, I don't know that much. I know of uh, like attempts from the past of like uh, uh, creating these libertarian communities. Uh, there was this gold gulch in Chile, I believe, that failed. So um, 
um i mean you you were you were being pretty descriptive earlier talking about privately owned places where you right. sign a contract to to join yeah. and and that contract is in perpetuity so uh -huh. those kind of systems yeah so yeah that sounds amazing uh but also depends on how uh the law is enforceable or the contracts are enforceable because still we live under this system where uh the state uh, has this monopoly on the judicial system and law enforcement so that's um that's the weak spot <laughs> it is the weak spot which is why i asked you about bitcoin because arguably you could posit that um bitcoin disenfranchises the state therefore it does in the long term in yes. the long run but um the problem with uh, I have even a problem with like uh, Bitcoin citadels as they are. Uh, it's a sim similar concept to private cities, I, I think. Um, the land always uh, is in some like uh, state jurisdiction. And it's just the nature of state that it has a full monopoly uh, on violence and on enforcing uh, the law of the land uh, in the region. So... In the short term, I'm kind of, kind of skeptical of uh, us being able to build these communities, and I'm more in favor of uh, instead of like seclusion of uh, libertarians and bitcoiners, uh, just being part of the society uh, and trying to like either through um, rational means, like explaining orange peeling people, getting them on board, or through like incentives, building good businesses, building good applications and tools to just get on board uh, the rest of the society. Because if we seclude ourselves, uh, that's never a good look, I would say, from the majority of the society. There have, there have been many attempts like that, but maybe I misunderstand the concept. I think it's a great concept for the long run when the state is sufficiently weak, or maybe it is possible now in some other uh, parts of the planet. I don't think, like in Czech Republic, you could build a private city. <laughs> uh, um, I should, I think, uh, uh, the seasteaders would probably mm -hmm. have an issue with you. You know what seasteaders? Yeah, are? yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they would say, "Well, we have a jurisdiction that has, doesn't belong to anyone." So, yeah, hopefully. I mean, I, not that I necessarily think the seasteading seasteading's any better or worse than anything else, but, um, but so so you you you're bullish in the long run, yes, and in the short run. Your your how do you see the best path forward? If if you were if, if if you were talking to someone who was who had a belief in the free city model, um, what would they be advised to do in the short term? Mm, my advice would be to not to try to build a city or a community um, on a like a. On a, on a and then like a previously empty space, like uh, just start with uh, where you are. And uh, if you are like, I think it's much better to try to change like your surroundings. You don't have to change uh, the whole nation. It's good to start with maybe your uh, local, uh, local shop uh, with your neighbors. Uh, and I know that's hard because I've been part of uh, the housing committee for uh, the 10 years and... <laughs> It's just a nightmare. <laughs> so, uh, Correct. Yeah, I, I don't know. Well, yeah, maybe one example is um, if you're living in a city and you know about other like uh, people that have uh, similar leanings to you, like libertarian Bitcoiners, let's say, it might be a good idea to uh, buy a house together or just uh, move together in one building gradually, like 10 flats, and try to get uh, like libertarians in maybe if you are a uh, like og bitcoiner and you have uh, sufficient money maybe buy the building and uh, try to have like uh, tenants that are uh, philosophical philosophically close to you and keep the building like uh, the best maintained in the street and lead by example uh, but do it in your current community i think that's what what's uh, what that's like there's basically nothing to criticize against uh, about that but if you build like your own village where you homeschool your children uh 
um, you are vocal against like vaccinations and drink raw milk and stuff like that, people will just point fingers at you, at you and uh, say you are some crazy uh, potential terrorist or something. There's good practical advice, I, I'd imagine. It's funny that it's come up in conversation three times today, talking to three different people, was that we're living in an age where um, digital relationships are manifesting physically mm -hmm. and and it's all a lot it's really it's really accelerated since lockdowns when everyone went online and realized that their their ideologically aligned brothers and sisters were out there somewhere and it's been a couple of years now and you know it seems to be manifesting more and more but i like i like your take it's it's true there's two ways to do this one is to to transform from the inside and the other one which i have to say a lot just as many people believe is to say okay look i i'm sick of trying to hmm. save this from within um i'm just going to ignore that and go and do something else which i would argue is the bitcoin way almost i mean satoshi didn't try and campaign to change monetary policy mm -hmm. he he created a new thing and you can ignore the old monetary policy now right. so so would, would am i barking up the wrong tree there is there is, is there any truth in that well uh yeah it's a parallel system you don't need to go against the current system as such uh you basically just do your own thing and it works for you it works for your friends family it works for uh, people in developing nations for whom the system never really worked and uh, yeah you basically no longer care about what goes on in the central banks in uh, the IMF and yeah they are criticizing it, criticizing it all the time but they cannot stop it so it brings a huge peace of mind and a huge uh, like optimistic towards the future and yeah, you can see that quality in Bitcoiners that they are usually quite family oriented and uh, take more care about themselves, have this low time preference because, uh, mm, yeah, you don't need to forcefully change anything. Uh, it's a peaceful revolution. And slowly the old system disappears into irrelevance. Hopefully, yeah. I, I believe like um, it boils down to economics again, like... Uh, in the long run, the good money will drive out the bad one because uh, the bad money will basically hyperinflate to do nothing and people will naturally look for alternatives and it has nothing to do with understanding economics or political philosophy. People just tend to look for alternatives if uh, the current uh, thing no longer works for them, which is increasingly what uh, fiat is becoming. Like It's uh, becoming useless in terms of long-term savings and in some way also in terms of uh, medium of exchange because because of more and more restrictions coming in all the time and it's getting politicized with sanctions with uh, the freedom convoy uh, ostrac ostracization from the system and this is not getting any better so in the long run i'm very optimistic about uh, freedom taking over because it basically boils down to economic incentives. And I believe economic laws are are as strong as natural laws and they will they will um, prevail in the long run. You can suppress them for some time, but they will bounce back even stronger then. Hallelujah to that. Last question, because, um, yeah. and we ask everyone that comes on this podcast, um, you have a one year sabbatical in which you can do whatever you want. It's all paid for. You have money yeah. at your fingertips. What do you do in your one year? It, it even has longevity. If you were to take that money and build a, a hotel, the hotel would still be there when, when the, the year was up. What would you do? Right. Yeah, that would be very exciting. Um, I would travel quite a lot with my family, probably. <laughs> um, and I would probably sit down and write another book. Uh, I'm just finishing my third book now. So, uh, but there's always things to think about and write down what's your what's your book called or if it doesn't have a name what's it about yeah it doesn't have a name uh it's it's in czech but in english it would be called uh, the return of sound money and obviously it's about bitcoin <laughs> great well 
thanks for talking to us. That was very highly informative. Um, and um, good luck with a new book. And I, lo- I haven't read your old books, but I love the titles of your books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the books will be published in English, hopefully, this year. Okay, I was going to say, it's not possible. And thanks for the socks as well. Yeah. I I got some new honey badger socks. Honey badger socks. <laughs> Is that, how, did you say that you have a company that makes socks? Well, uh, I have my like own uh, line of merch because I do my podcast and uh, all kinds of like Bitcoin education. So I have uh, uh, my own merch. I print my own T-shirts and do socks. And Great. Stuff I, like I'd that. try and push new listeners to your podcast, but we won't, <laughs> we won't be able to understand yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can check out my articles on Bitcoin Magazine. Yeah. Well, Joseph, thank you very much for speaking and um, hopefully we'll see you again another time. Thank you. Thank you.